So welcome. This is our School Funding 101 uh, recorded PowerPoint part two where we go into a little more detail on the different components of the foundation formula. Let's start with this pie chart. You saw this in part one. Again, it's just to show you the major components and the things that we'll be talking about in the context of this particular component of the presentation. Um, this next one is meant to show which ones of the components are really based on student counts and student characteristics. So you'll see that large uh, cluster of seven items to the left, which are the student-based components. And then there are are several components that are capacity-based, in other words, that are sensitive to the realities that, that a, uh, a local school district faces by virtue of its ability to raise local revenue. There are two that are performance-based, in other words, how well uh, a school district is performing. And then finally, a service-level component, which is the transportation component. So in this slide, we show the percentage of the total foundation funding that is comprised by each of these elements. So student-based funding, again, being the largest component of the overall formula, is about 77% of the total. It's important to reflect that not every element of the formula carries the same weight. And so you can see that performance-based funding, while there are two separate elements, comprise less than half a percent of the overall total funding within the formula. So let's um, let's talk about the opportunity grant, uh, which again, as we said, is close to sixty percent of the overall funding formula. And at the end of the day, it's a relatively simple idea. Uh, for fiscal year nineteen, it starts with a dollar amount per pupil that has been arrived at through various means over the years and adjusted historically. Right now, for fiscal year nineteen, it's six thousand and twenty dollars per pupil. And that's multiplied by a count of students uh, to generate a very large dollar amount. Again, if you think about it in terms of 1.7 million students. uh, And then the state share index is applied to that amount. And that forms the sort of the fundamental basis, the foundation, if you will, of the uh, amount that a school district receives from the state. Uh, The next piece that is important to that is special education. As was indicated, it's about 11 percent. This is to support funding for students with disabilities. What we do here is we actually um, divide students with disabilities into six categories based on the severity of their disabling condition. And there are then six dollar amounts that correspond to each of those six categories, the lowest being about, you know, almost $1,600 per student and the highest being over $25,000 per student. And again, the same thing happens. The numbers of students in each of those categories is multiplied by the respective dollar amounts. The state share index is then applied, and that generates the amount of money that a school district will receive for special education. Right now, it's about 14 percent of students across the state are identified as students with disabilities. Something similar then happens with economically disadvantaged students, which is about 5% of the total funding of the formula. The measure we use there are students who qualify for free or reduced price lunch, which statewide is almost 50% of students, 48.7%. And then uh, there is a dollar value uh, that is multiplied by a district's poverty index. And that poverty index is essentially a computation of the relative level of poor students as compared to the state average, if I'm remembering correctly, Um, uh, which is right. The third part of this um, uh, slide tells you how the district's poverty index is um, is computed, so that acts as a as a somewhat of a of an amplifier for districts that have higher concentrations of poverty, uh, vis-a-vis this dollar amount, the two hundred seventy two dollars per student that's been identified. And the thing that I would note here is that um, because of this uh, poverty index or disadvantaged index, um, every district in the state has a different per pupil amount that is provided for the students in their district that is economically disadvantaged. So the higher the concentration of disadvantaged students, the higher the per pupil amount that is provided for each one of those. The thought being that as the greater, as there is a greater concentration of students who are disadvantaged, the needs and the additional services that should be provided to benefit those students increase. 
The next component is the K3 literacy component. Again, a very small percentage, only about 1.5%. But it's funding that's provided for students in grades K through 3, about 500,000 students. And there are two approaches, right? There's one piece that is, in fact, equalized. So the state share index is applied. And that's a computation of $193 for each student in the K3 grade band. And then an additional $127 for each of those students that is not equalized. So every district is assured that $127, and then it might get some additional based on the state share index of that $193. The result is a range of between $136 and $300 per student in K-3 for the literacy component. So the next element of funding uh, is funding for gifted education. Uh, There are two components to this element of the formula. The first is funding for gifted identification. Uh, It is provided at $5.05 per pupil, and that's based on all students in the district. Um, There are approximately 16.4% of students that are identified as as gifted in the state. Uh, The second component of the formula for gifted uh, funding is uh, based on this concept of unit funding. And so there is a dollar amount, um, and then there are two components, uh, intervention specialist services. So there's $37,370 provided for every 1,100 students at the district, right? At the district, not students who are identified as being gifted. And then there is an additional uh, 37,370 for every 3,300 students that are residents of the district. And so this funding, two notes, is based on the students who reside in the district, not the students who are identified as gifted. And also, this is an element of the formula where the state share is not applied to the calculated funding. So the next slide speaks to, again, another relatively small component, and that's career technical education funding. The state provides supplemental funding when certain conditions are met. It has to be an approved program. It has to have an approved teacher uh, that's properly licensed in the program. And then those programs are also divided into five categories based on the on the relative you know, cost. Uh, you can imagine a welding program is going to have a higher cost than perhaps a business uh, program, and the formula attempts to uh, acknowledge that. So you have five categories, and the range is $1,308 per pupil in the lowest category and almost $5,200 per pupil in the highest categories. Um, It also accommodates the fact that uh, many students participating in career technical education programs are only doing so for part of a day. And so it, um, uh, you know, it reconciles that as part of the computation. Uh, You know, at the end of the day, we have about 30,500 full-time equivalencies at traditional districts that qualify for career technical education funding and about 32,500 full-time equivalents at our joint vocational schools. And one additional thing that I think is important to note is that those 32,500 FTE at the Joint Vocational School Districts are separate and apart from the funding and the formula that we've been talking about. So the $8 billion that we've been discussing is the money that is flowing to traditional districts. There is an additional $300 million that is flowing directly to joint vocational school districts and their primary mission of providing career technical education. The last component of the student-driven funding uh, within the formula is funding for limited English proficient students, Uh, a a very small part of the overall funding in the formula, um, but funding for about 54,000 students, um, about 3.2% of students identified as English language learners. Similar to career tech and special ed, there are three different categories that range between $758 and a little over $1,500. Um, And that is based on the time a student has been in school in the United States, as well as the proficiency of their acquisition of the English language. And so the first year that a student uh, is enrolled in a a public school in the United States, the funding is provided at that highest level and then tiers down as the student gains uh, a higher mastery in the English language. So that concludes the student-based components. Now we're going to shift to the uh, service-based component, which uh, there is only one, which is the transportation funding, again, about 6% of the total. 
And this one's based on the greater of two factors, either the statewide cost per rider, which again, annualized is close to $1,000 per student, or an amount that's computed as a cost per mile, right now $4.68. So we run numbers for each district using each of these components, and whichever is the greater one generates the amount that is believed to be what that district needs. Then a state share percentage is applied, but it's modified from the way we've been talking about it previously, um, and ensures at least every district gets a minimum state share percentage of 25%. If your state share percentage as computed is higher than 25%, the state will kick in that higher percentage, but no one uh, will be less than 25%. There's also some additional funding that's um, provided to the very low density districts. In other words, where the where the pupils number of pupils per square mile is really low, which implies a greater burden on the transportation system of those districts. So there's a little bit of accommodation for that piece of it. So the next section of funding is is what we have termed capacity based funding. So it is driven based on the characteristics of the district not as much the students who live in the district. So there are two elements to this, targeted assistance and capacity aid. Uh, Targeted assistance is the second largest part of the overall formula, just over 11%. There are two tiers to this. The first tier uses a measure of wealth that is similar, uh, but is slightly different than the concept that was described in the calculation of the state share index. So it is relying on property values and federally adjusted gross income, and a wealth measure and a wealth per pupil is calculated for every district in the state. Um, The funding here works to equalize uh, the equivalent of six mils of property tax up to the 80th percentile. So said a little differently, we look at what is the wealth per pupil of the district at the 80th percentile, the 489th wealthiest district in the state. And we look to make sure that every district has a wealth per pupil that is the equivalent of six mils um, that falls below that 489th district. So there is a range of per pupil funding that is provided here. The district that is at the 79th percentile is receiving a very small amount of funding per, on a per pupil basis. The district who has the lowest wealth measure in the state is receiving uh, close to $2,500 per pupil uh, through this targeted assistance funding. One of the things you might be asking yourself is, why does the state do this? What is the public policy basis for it? And what what it basically tries to do is say, hey, look, um, many, many communities, if not most communities across the state, try to do a little bit more for their students than the state formulas um, do on its own. Uh, for a variety of reasons. And and this basically says what we don't want to do is disadvantage those places that really want to do more but don't actually have the income or property uh, capacity to do more. And so the state says we're, we're going to help you do that more almost regardless of whether you vote the uh, any additional property taxes on yourself or not. We're going to deal with you as if we want you to have – six mils more available to you, and we're going to give you the state piece of that depending on your relative per pupil wealth as measured for this component. So it's in some ways, it's a supplemental funding assurance in the spirit of saying that, you know, we know that communities really always want to do a little bit more above and beyond, and some can sometimes struggle with doing that a little bit more. The second tier within the targeted assistance funding um, is relatively new. And it it is the result, uh, districts that have a large share of their value in the form of agricultural value. And so the qualifier for this is not based on a wealth per pupil measure. It is based on uh, the percentage of agricultural value that comprises a district's total valuation. And so to qualify for this, you are a district that has more than 10% of your total value in the form of agricultural value. 
it is again not connected to tier one and so the um, amounts and the per pupil uh, funding that is provided through this second tier is based on that that agricultural property value percentage so the funding here is scaled so that the higher the percentage of agricultural value that it, that you have in your district the higher the per pupil amount that is ultimately provided the second funding element uh, within the capacity-based funding is called capacity aid. It represents a relatively small portion of the overall funding formula, but for some districts can represent a fairly sizable uh, stream of funding. It is, again, a relatively new element of the funding formula, and it, it is per-pupil funding based on the value of one mil of property tax compared to the statewide median. So statewide, districts can generate about $238,000. Um, that, that's the median amount. There are certainly districts in the state that, that generate a significantly lower amount with one mil of property tax. And the thought here is to equalize and to provide additional funding for those districts that, again, have difficulty in raising revenues locally. The difference between capacity aid and targeted assistance is that an, a large urban school district like Cleveland or Columbus can generate significant dollar amounts with just one mil of voted property tax, where a small district, um, a, a smaller rural district, a small town that has a small student population might find it difficult to raise more than fifty, seventy-five, one hundred thousand dollars with one um, mil of voted property property tax. So to summarize this section on capacity, one of the reasons in that graph we showed you in part one that shows the progress that the state has made over the years and actually boosting the amount of that lowest wealth column vis-a-vis -vis comparison to the highest wealth quintile is by virtue of these kinds of mechanisms, these kinds of mechanisms that really target resources to the lowest wealth districts of the state and acknowledging the challenges that they face uh, to raise revenue um, on their own. So now the last part of this is really a discussion of um, performance-related components. And there are really two – this is, again, about 0.4 percent of the overall funding. There are two uh, areas where there is a performance bonus, the third grade reading proficiency bonus uh, and the high school graduation rate bonus. It's used uh, using the prior year report card uh, and can generate up to about $400 uh, per pupil depending on those two factors. An additional observation that is worth noting is that this is the first time that the funding formula has reflected individual student level performance. So there have been previous academic performance bonuses that have been based on district level performance, but these two funding elements generate dollars for the local school district based on individual student performance in the third grade reading test and uh, high school graduation. The last thing we want to cover uh, in this part is a discussion of the guarantees and the gain cap. And again, I'll let Aaron talk you through these uh, final four slides. Sure. So after the calculations and computations are made for all of the elements that we have uh, discussed up to this point, there is a comparison of that calculated funding to the prior year's funding or to what is called a guarantee base. Um, the guarantee base has been around for many, many years, although the calculation of the guarantee will sometimes change from biennium to biennium. Um, in 2018, the guarantee represented about 2.8% uh, of the overall funding formula. The, the steps to the guarantee calculation are listed here. Um, so every district in the state starts by having their guarantee set at 100% of their prior year funding or their 2017 state aid. Um, there is an adjustment made for districts that have lost more than 5% of their total student population between 2014 and 2016. Um, but no district in either 2018 or 2019 will receive less than 95% of what they received in the 16-17 school year, in fiscal year 17. 
the next slide looks historically at um, what those guarantee amounts have been as as compared to the overall funding formula. And the point there is that to pay for that, those guarantees do cost money because, in fact, you're giving uh, districts more than the formula computes. So you're able to identify an actual dollar cost of the guarantee, which is what this table shows. Go ahead, Aaron. And shows the number of districts that were subject to the guarantee in a given fiscal year. And so you can see that in the school year that we just finished, in the, in the current school year, there are over 300 districts that are subject to this guarantee to the tune of over $220 million. Um, that represents a spike in the number of districts as well as the dollar amount. You can see that previous to 2018, the state had made progress in reducing the overall dollar amount that was paid um, through the guarantee as well as the number of districts that were subject to the guarantee. Um, in 2018, those 329 districts, though, were provided guarantee funding that equated to, for the district that had the lowest guarantee funding, about a dollar and 21 cents per pupil to the district that was most reliant on the guarantee of more than $4,500 per pupil. Um, and so the guarantee impacts districts differently at different magnitudes. Uh, and it is not primarily districts that are wealthier or districts that have lower capacity. It's, it's not, it does not distinguish between larger districts or smaller districts. Um, perhaps the reason why there are more districts on the guarantee in this biennium um, is because of the convergence of increasing property values, um, especially in rural and agricultural rich districts, as well as the fact that there were very few changes to the funding formula in this biennium. There were very few increases to those per pupil amounts that would counteract a district state share um, decreasing and receiving a marginally lower amount of per pupil funding than perhaps would have been would have been received in previous biennium. And the other factor too is the declining uh, counts of students. Uh, in fact, those two maps that we showed in part one actually manifest themselves in this phenomenon because the combination of declining enrollment and increasing property values ultimately leads to a lesser computed amount of state revenue uh, that the guarantee then holds you harmless against and that drives up the cost and drives up the number of, of districts that are on the guarantee. So that represents the districts that are receiving more funding from the state than would otherwise be provided to them through a calculated amount. Um, conversely, there are districts where the state limits funding and the state is providing less than what the calculated amount uh, would otherwise be provided to a district called the gain cap. Um, it has existed, again, at different percentages in different elements of the formula in different biennium. Uh, in this biennium, in the 18 and 19 school years, the um, increase that a school district can receive compared to their 2017 funding is 3% in each fiscal year. And in the same way that we have lowered the guarantee base for districts that have seen declining uh, student enrollment, we have lifted the gain cap for districts that are experiencing growth. And so districts that are increasing in student enrollment can see uh, growth in their cap this year uh, the 1819 school year of up to 6%. So a district that is rapidly growing can see uh, their funding grow above that 3% um, base. And so an example here, a district with 4.1% you know, growth would be able to see their cap lifted by 4.1%. And then this slide uh, shows how, what has the amount of funding that has been capped represent in terms of, of the total funding formula. So again, progress has been made over the last several biennium in reducing both the number of districts that are subject to the gain cap, as well as um, the amount of funding overall that's been withheld. And so it, this year, we are at a, at a low compared to the last two biennium, where there are 142 districts that are estimated are subject to this gain cap. Um, at a cost to those districts of about $433 million or savings to the state of the same amount. Right. Or one other way to look at it would be it would take $433 million to, you know, fully fund the, the cap districts. That's correct. 
So in the school year that we just finished, fiscal year 18, the cap reduced funding um, for less than a dollar per pupil for the district that had was least impacted by the cap to almost $2,800 per pupil for the district that was subject to the cap to the greatest amount. So, you know, again, just a, one quick summary before we close is we've just covered with you all the different pieces. And so the, ultimately the way things work is that each of these 12 computations is made for every district and they're all added up. Uh, the guarantee or the cap computation that is made based on the end result. And that generates a dollar value that the state says this is what the state uh, has computed as its contribution to what a district ought to have available to itself to educate its students over the course of the year. And then we pay that out in two payments every month over the course of the year um, and, you know, making some estimated computations at the beginning of the year and then truing up to actual values as we get into the year, and even after we close the year, truing up to some additional uh, values as might be appropriate for those particular computations, and that's how the system works. So these two presentations uh, are our attempts to provide an overview of the overall construct of the school funding formula. Certainly, we're happy to answer any additional questions that might arise as a result of listening to this, and if you have questions about specific elements or questions about specific district, a specific district to understand how these elements impact their funding, what their valuation is, what their student enrollment is. Uh, we're certainly more than happy to provide any additional information that would be useful to you.